Hello, I'm Caroline Jones. Tonight's Australian story centres on a case that could have stepped straight from the pages of an Agatha Christie novel. It concerns a peaceful rural community, a group of passionate beekeepers, and the murder of a popular local man called Tony Knight. When the police forensic investigation got underway, it uncovered not only the secrets of a killer, but some unexpected family history as well. On Monday the 4th of June 2007, it was brought to our attention that a body had been located in a makeshift dwelling. It used to be a deer farm. Um, very isolated. Probably closest neighbours would be maybe one to two k's away. Being a uh, bachelor sort of pad, it probably wasn't the tidiest place that you could go into, but it certainly didn't show any um, signs that there'd been some sort of altercation. So what we had was uh, a male person who we only knew as Tony Knight through identification was located in the house and no other signs of why this happened. Tony knew nothing. He went to sleep one night, and that's all he knows. So for that, we can know that he's at peace. I think it frightened the Woodford community to think that somebody who was in a passive industry like beekeeping, minding his own business, and then the next thing, he's dead. For what? When an investigation is conducted, it does get into you know, every area of, of somebody's life and their family's life. And things will come out of that that no one would ever possibly ever know. And uh, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. Probably met Tony first on the road, as you do meet new beekeepers. The beekeepers do work in pairs, mainly because they've got to bounce off each other's ideas of where the honey's going to be at the right time of the year. Tony was a very friendly person. He's a very honest type of person. You know, if anybody had pinched other people's bee sites or something like that, he'd certainly tell them what he thought of them. There was a few that possibly had rubbed him up the wrong way and he'd maybe rubbed them up the wrong way. But on the whole, in the beekeeping industry of South East Queensland, he was extremely well known and, in my view, well respected. The only people he really associated with were other beekeepers. And they're a unique mob, very loyal, very loyal to each other. I found a lot about them that I never knew existed. They are their own little community. Speaking to those guys, you really got the feeling, the heartfelt feeling that, you know, there was a genuine trust and liking for Tony as, as, a, as a good person. Tony was always an unusual boy. I guess the best way to describe him was full of energy, um, and yet he had a unique interest. In his bedroom, there could be anything. You just didn't go in there. He had snakes in tanks and lizards and you know so he was right from when he was little he was always interested in animals yeah he was hard to keep tabs on because he was diagnosed as having ADHD or hyperactivity disorder when he was a young fellow and that was a challenge for him with learning and school and behavior and getting on with people most families have their own difficulties and it would be wrong to say that ours didn't have it but he had his life, I had my life. I think there was a bit of distance between Tony and Vernon. Maybe the age, maybe just that they had just different lifestyles. Tony always just seemed to be that radical element. And again, as we say, the beekeeping industry was a perfect outlet. At around the age of 15, he went to work for a local beekeeper. But it probably wasn't until he was in his mid-twenties to early thirties that he really moved into what you call a serious beekeeping business. Tony became very enthusiastic about beekeeping. 
and uh, developed into a, a very successful beekeeper and, uh, in my opinion, became a bee master. The fact that his colleagues spoke of him as being a bee master um, made me so proud because it was his whole life. When um, he had hair looking like mine, he, he was still a bit of a rascal, but once he got up high and had a pretty respected job in the executive of the Queensland Beekeepers Association, he uh, had to get a proper haircut. <laughs> An incursion of Asian honeybees was detected in Cairns last month and it sent a collective shiver down the spines of beekeepers around the country. The Asian honeybee can be a carrier of varroa mites, which have decimated the honeybee population around the world. Tony was chairman of the Queensland Beekeepers Association Disease Committee, and because of Tony's position, he would have been an early person to go and assess the situation in Cairns. Tony being um, on the executive and realised the federal body needed some money for funds, they decided to do a nude calendar throughout the Beekeeping Association. The intention was to make some money for some project and a dozen beekeepers bared most of their body to <laughs> in, uh, in beekeeping sort of poses and Tony certainly was one of the leading lights in that particular project. Uh, well, it would have suited Tony right down to the ground. <laughs> Charlie's a big lad, big hairy lad, and uh, they decided that a nude calendar would probably make a few bob and promote the, uh, the beekeeping society. I'm not too sure about that, but uh, it's quite interesting viewing. So that, that, looking at those pictures, they were quite tight and, uh, and probably, yeah, they had a lot of fun. They have a lot of fun with each other. After Tony got back from hunting Asian bees in Cairns, uh, we planned to get together and work on his shed, but I couldn't get hold of him on the phone. I rang him a number of times, but no answer. So it was then that I thought, something's going wrong here. He might have had an accident or something. So anyway, I went up to Woodford and, uh, well, events started to unfold from there. I uh, we, uh, went into his house there and, well, it was obvious at the time that he was, he was dead, see, because of the smell. And, and you know, there's the blowflies there and what have you, flying around in the dark. I went and got the police at Woodford we went back to Tony's place. Tony had been there for, for some time, so he couldn't be identified visually. So DNA was taken from family members, siblings, and uh, from that we got an identification of Tony. It was a complete shock. And I said, what could have happened to him? I mean, he was a very fit person, um, very strong. And the only thing I could think of was that, that he must have had Something wrong with his heart. We thought he passed away in bed. For three or four days, we um, thought he must have had a hole in the heart or he died of a heart attack. So everybody felt very, very sad about that, losing Tony in that way. When the coroner started working on Tony, she realised it wasn't a heart attack. It's probably at that point that we got alerted by the pathologist that uh, she'd conducted an X-ray and metal fragments were located in the spinal cord up around the neck region. There appeared to be a gunshot entry wound to the upper right shoulder. So that was obviously then a uh, homicide investigation as, as far as we're concerned and, and off we went back to the, the scene. We'd uh, just like to appeal to anyone who may have seen Tony um, after the 28th of May. Being in front of the cameras was quite nerve-wracking because your emotions are in tatters as it is. Who would want to do something like this? Simply? We have no idea. Our search uh, of, of the house, um, looking for a motive of why someone would do this to Tony, because everything we'd come up about the man is that he's well-respected. 
very well liked. Financially, he was sound. We found a safe in the house that contained several thousand dollars. So it appeared that robbery wasn't a motive. There was no past relationships that had, had appeared to um, have soured and caused problems for Tony. So we're a bit of a loss about how or why someone would come and do this in a remote location. This is a uh, World Through interview with, uh, with Howard Kirby. Early in the investigation, um, Howard Kirby brought it to my attention that uh, he believed there was some honey missing. I did notice that the full IBCs had appeared to have gone. So the police got me back to Tony's place to show them where the IBC honey containers had been. And, and is that what you're referring to as an IBC? Yeah, that's those yellow containers there, Capilano. Tony, obviously at the time, had honey on hand. I think the figure they quoted was $40,000, which is, is, is quite a lot of honey. It's a benefit for beekeepers at times if they have a good season to keep honey on hand and market it when it, when it better suits them, because honey stores for a very long time without losing quality. I know they've found honey in the Ferrer's tombs and it was still classed as fit to eat. The um, police asked me to come over and have a look and um, I could see where Tony's drums should have been sitting there. There were a whole lot of forklift marks on the, on the ground here. So we put two and two together and thought Tony's honey was gone. Well, up until the point where Charlie and Howard had told us about the honey, it wasn't obvious to us that that was a motive for this crime. Seemed a bit strange, but, but a bit of a, basically the only motive we had at that time. Also, more importantly, was these scattered bits of paper. They were all around where the pallets were. We couldn't make hide nor hair of, of actually what they were, and they were seized, and they turned out to be pivotal. On the 14th of June, the investigation identified that a number of IBC containers had been dumped on a side road at Bow Desert. So we went and had a look. And um, whilst we were there, one of the uniformed constables, Aaron Baxter, uh, made mention to us that he was an amateur beekeeper and um, thought it was of interest that only two weeks before, on the 30th, uh, 31st of May, that uh, he actually went to an industrial accident at, at um, Stockley, south of Brisbane. He said that he saw a truck loaded with IBC containers, one of which had fallen off and appeared to have pinned the driver to the ground. And that's the first time we come into the name of uh, Donald Robert Alcock. When we arrived at the address, we saw Mr Alcock um, on a stretcher and um, he was being loaded into the back of the ambulance. He looked to be in a bit of shock, so um, it, we sort of let them go, obtained his details so we could um, speak to him later if needed. And it looked to me as though when the drum had fallen off the truck, uh, it had been it had fallen onto the wheelbarrow as well, and that's where it had squashed uh, Mr Alcock's hands underneath the, um, the drum. The two constables who had some sort of sixth sense at that time thought, well, it doesn't just seem right. So using their mobile phones, they took several photographs of the truck, the containers and the surrounding area. And those photographs showed that the containers that were on that truck were the same containers that we found down at, at Bow Desert. Scientific officers done a further examination and they found um, barcodes on the side of these containers. And then we went back to the uh, rolled up bits of paper that we located at the crime scene and it was a perfect fit for a barcode, an issue to Tony Knight. That led us to believe that the person that was injured at Stock Lee, that's Mr Orcock, had knowledge of the crime. Mr Orcock's driver's licence was issued in New South Wales and it indicated that he resided at Tenerfield. We also came across information that he was returning to Brisbane for other matters. We intercepted him and about 10 o'clock that morning I arrested Mr Orcock for the murder of Tony Knight. He had this complete look of shock on his face that he couldn't really, I don't think he could really uh, understand that he'd been caught. Presently, I'm at a property known as Ellenthorpe on the Casino Road at Tenerfield, approximately one. The search warrant was executed at his home address at Tenerfield. This is where the barrels were, is that correct? Yep. Twenty odd drums of, of honey were located. Uh, torn, torn yep. paper or something. Yep, we stripped it all off. They drums, Dom brought home, 
and um, yeah, they've got honey in them. Okay. Yeah. And do you know where they've come from? Over the day, I'm working it out, but <laughs> beforehand, no, not really. Okay, so there's a, a, a tin of paint. It certainly was in the process of, of re-identifying the honey drums and to offload those as, as his own. Um, I've actually helped Don do some of the painting of these drums. So that's the stencil there? Yep, that's our brand name. Okay. Yep, that's a case there. Mm -hmm. All right, so there's a, mm. a casing there. And indeed, the firearm was located so in his bedroom. The, and what's, what, what is that item there? Well, I'm guessing it's some sort of gun. I don't like guns. So. OK. All right, and who, who put that there? Don. Once we knew who he was, it came out that Mr Alcock, another professional beekeeper, did go around and, and steal other people's hives or destroy other people's hives just out of spite. There's two in there. But as far as police recorded history, uh, Mr Alcock, uh, he had no, no previous at all. OK, this is the second interview we conducted between Detective Ford and uh, Donald Alcock. I've walked up to the gates here. His version is that he only met Tony through uh, another professional beekeeper. He went to Tony's address and he, he made comment that he's seen a huge amount of honey that he was sitting on. I sat here thinking about it all and, and trying to get it all clear in my head. And so what were you trying to get clear in your head? If I was doing the right thing or not. I think at that stage he realised that uh, if he was going to take somebody else's honey, Tony would be a good candidate. I decided that, that if I was going to do it, I had to do it. What did you decide you had to do? If Tony was home, I was going to have to either maim him or, or hurt him bad to, to, to knock the honey off. He's walked up to Tony's car and put his hand on the bonnet and, and it was warm, so he knew that, that highly likely Tony was inside. He said that really annoyed him, that he'd come here to steal the honey and that Tony, Tony was at home. The door was open. I, I just walked in. I seemed to get a little bit further each time. And then I, I spotted him and I stood there. Can I have a break? You're choking. Sorry. <laughs> you feel you're up to walking in here? I, I don't know. Well, you try it and you let me know. Yeah. Um. I saw Tony laying in bed and sort of huddled up a bit and, and, and I, I, I I pulled the bloody trigger. <laughs> From that, he says he went outside, sat down, had a bit of a cry about what he'd done, and uh, whoever got over that and said, well, I'm here to get the honey, and away he went. He's loaded his truck up and he's travelled down through Caboolture, through Brisbane to Stockley, where he's unloaded his truck and an IBC container has fallen on him and pinned him to the ground. He still wants that honey. He's gone back to the crime scene where he's loaded up the 44 gallon drums and he's actually transported those back to Tannerfield. Didn't want anyone to, to, to see what I'd done. I was ashamed. He was charged later that day with murder and with robbery of violence and remanded in custody. The trial went ahead on the 25th of March 2009. He pleaded not guilty. In the defence, he did admit to shooting Tony, but he only meant to maim him. So that way he wouldn't get life. 41 year old Knight, he'd given his killer a tour of his property. That's how Donald Alcock knew about the stockpiled honey. Personally, I found the trial very difficult. The truth spoke for itself. He was short of money. Ultimatum had been put to him by his wife to fix it. He'd met Tony some months before. Beekeepers keep honey on hand. It's like money in the bank. Wait till the market's better. So the only thing between him and profiting that was Tony. So he disposed of him, went about picking up the honey, supposedly to solve his problem. I think from Alcock's perspective, it was simple as that. The New South Wales man has been jailed for life for murdering a fellow beekeeper on the Sunshine Coast in 2007. Tony Knight's friends and family say he was a generous man who would have given Donald Alcock honey if he'd come to him for help. Tony died through a cowardly act from a person that had no other motive 
than greed. And he believed that his financial gain was far more important than Tony's life. As a brother to my children, and the loss of him is absolutely incredible. Not just for the industry, but for our families. The irony is, Mr Alcock's undoing was his ill-gotten gain. The honey he stole has led to his life in prison. The only um, way of positively identifying Tony was through DNA, using DNA samples from siblings. Yeah. That opened up a whole new avenue for one of the family members. Is this exactly what they're doing? Or mm, is this one that's been much. already... Vernon's got a whole different, different story to his life now. Uh, should be September. Warren Ford came one Sunday morning. He said to me, we've uh, run a DNA check with yourself and your sister, and it's come back negative. And I said, uh, oh, that's OK, I understand. Um, you know, it could well have been that Tony wasn't dead. They thought I was coming with news to them to say that Tony had a different dad because they always thought Tony was a little bit different to the rest of the family. Then I realised what Warren was saying was, no, Tony's dad's, it's you, Vern, that, that aren't dad's. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that came as a bit of a shock. We sort of laughed to start with, but I suppose it's impacted on Vern since then. Vern's wife, Diane, she thought it was a little bit humorous, and I think that helped Vern to, to lighten the load. It, it was confusing, and you, I understand why people who've been adopted would suddenly want to go anywhere in the world to try and find who they belong to, because I guess as, as, as humans, it's just human nature to know, well, what was your father like? What did he do? Um, is this why I'm that way? Or, you know, your own peculiarities, whether it be something positive, negative. So, yes, yeah, so I guess in that sense it, it uh, did, but I've reconciled oh, we, we with it. We reckon we know who he is. He's a rocket scientist. He's not. <laughs> <laughs> in your dreams. <laughs> I suppose a funeral is probably one of the first stages of grief for anybody that knew him and uh, everybody that loved him. You know, as a friend, it was unreal, you know, to see everybody there, you know. Extremely, extremely emotional. It wasn't a, a, it wasn't a church funeral as such, because he wasn't that way, you know. But it was extremely emotional, yeah. There was a lot of uh, grown men there that had tears in their eyes, I can say that. To go to the funeral and see close to 300 people and to sort of find the kind of person that he'd become, the calibre of friends that he had and the advancements that he was making in the beer industry, I was very proud of him. Yeah, I suppose Vernon wouldn't have known um, how widespread Tony's friends were. He probably wouldn't have known all these things Tony had done under the umbrella of the Queensland Beekeepers Association. I think for Charlie and his family and Howard as well, the loss would be as great, if not greater, to them because of the closeness that they had. He was a family member, I think, to Charlie like a brother. When he had a free moment or weekend, he always used to turn up. And just now, you know, everybody's busy and uh, he doesn't turn up. Yeah, I suppose that's one of the issues. When someone's very close to you, you, you miss the fellowship and I suppose there was a sort of love between us, really. It's so hard when somebody who's been part of your life is taken like that. He was a beautiful human being. And that the life he had was fulfilling. Boiled. 
Cyril would like to maintain this property because you're so close to Tony. Because I'm retired, Charlie and Cheryl felt that I might enjoy mucking around with some beehives. They're putting together some bee boxes to maybe have some hives here. And yeah, I mean, that's what Tony brought this place for. I hope Charlie and Don will always be with me, um, guiding me and um, helping me make decisions about um, Tony's, Tony's property, his estate. I just feel so at peace here and it's such a pretty piece of land um, that gradually as I get older um, I, I think I can see myself spending more and more time here. Yep.